The expression peak oil demand has been around for some decades, but the idea was generally ignored as being either impossible to predict or being so far into the future as not to be worth bothering about. Now it's back on the agenda, prompted in many cases by a series of announcements from countries around the world about plans to promote the widespread use of electric vehicles. European countries have been quick to announce proposals, but plans are also being drawn up in places such as Japan, China, India, Canada, and most recently in Russia. European interest in electric vehicles stems in part from growing concerns over the harmful effects of emissions from diesel vehicles. The matter received special prominence in 2015 when it emerged that the German car maker Volkswagen had installed software in diesel cars that was designed to record lower levels of pollution than was the case under actual driving conditions. This in turn led to a wider debate about the health hazards posed by particulates and nitrogen dioxide from the use of diesel fuels. The discussion initially focused on the effect that replacing diesel vehicles with electric ones might have on the demand for diesel fuel. But this has since widened out following proposals in some countries to phase out petrol driven cars as well. There are of course a number of factors to be considered in trying to forecast the effect of electric vehicles may have on demand for diesel and gasoline, including the rate at which electric vehicles are taken up, the type of electric vehicles, uh, passenger, commercial, um, hybrids, and the way in which these vehicles are used. One of the things electric vehicles are forecast to promote though is the sharing of electric vehicles. Another factor which remains unclear at present is the extent to which a ban on diesel cars will also apply to petrol vehicles. Clearly with one eye on the future, BP has recently considered a number of scenarios looking at the role of electric vehicles and the increasing use of renewable energy sources. In one of them, the evolving transition scenario, demand for oil continues to grow at around half a percent annually from 2018 to 2040, compared with a growth rate of 1.2% that we saw from 1990 to the start of the same period. The scenario assumes that government policies, technology and social preferences continue to evolve in a manner and the speed we've seen over recent years. The scenario sees a continuing growth in demand for transport fuels, although this is mainly from the non-road transport sector. Road transport energy demand grows at a slower pace and much of the growth in that sector is from heavy goods vehicles rather than cars. After 2030, the main source of growth in demand for oil comes from non-fuel use, mainly as a petrochemical feedstock. There will nevertheless be an impact on diesel consumption, especially in Europe, which could cause problems with its already troubled refining industry, which, despite recent capacity reductions, still has estimated a crude distillation surplus over a million barrels per day. One effect could be an increase in gasoline consumption, as several large cities impose bans on diesel vehicles in the most congested areas. Motorists may also be encouraged to switch to other forms of repulsion, including gasoline, by other measures such as changes in fuel duties and other taxes. Some sort of agreement is beginning to emerge amongst the industry forecasters that global oil demand will stop growing somewhere between 2030 and 2040, a view not necessarily and understandably shared by OPEC. Take Saudi Arabia's energy minister Khalid al Falil. He maintains that people in developing countries are likely to prefer the internal combustion engine over electric powered vehicles, and heavy goods vehicles are expected to remain oil driven for some time to come. In parts of Central and Eastern Europe, the consumption of diesel fuel is actually going up, partly by the growing use of second hand diesel cars that have been abandoned by their German owners and shipped eastwards. Railways there are also losing business to road vehicles. The main thing required for drivers to switch from diesel to electric vehicles is the provision of the infrastructure to allow recharging on a similar scale to the present network of petrol stations. That's clearly a long way off. But plans for more electric vehicles nevertheless continue to be announced. In what could be proving to be a landmark ruling, the EU Commission recently allowed the German government to subsidise the replacement of diesel buses with electric ones, which have been thought to break the Commission's rule on competitive markets. Electric buses are seen as having considerable potential because their fixed routes make it much easier to provide charging facilities since they operate over fairly confined areas. 
One of the countries that's most enthusiastic for electric buses is China, where concerns around air quality are prompting a move away from the internal combustion engine. Electric vehicles are forecast to account for 20% of new car sales in China by 2025, and the Chinese government says its demand for transport fuels will peak in 2030. To the north, Russia too is pushing electric vehicle sales, but being realistic, it's going to be some time before they make any real impact on fuel sales in that country, owing to the logistical challenge of providing sufficient charging points across such a huge landmass. Looking forward to 2030, 2040, some conventional cars will certainly remain on the roads. But take the UK for example, there's forecasts that the number of electric vehicles in the 2040s will be over 20 million. That's up from around 90,000 today. And we have to ask the question, how will these be powered? Charging them all will require additional electricity. And Britain, and this is the same across the world, will have to plough billions of pounds in new power plants, grid networks and electric vehicle charging points if it's to avoid the local power shortages when all these electric vehicles start to charge. We have to be honest and ask the question, is it likely that we're going to see this deployment? The cost of Hinkley Point C alone, that's a new build nuclear plant in the southwest of England, and the only plant currently being built in the UK, is estimated at around £20 billion. Gas plants are cheaper of course, uh, they're faster to build, but investments in new ones is flat. Renewable energy presents problems of matching supply and demand. Solar panels, for instance, produce no power at night when electric vehicle drivers would ideally be wanting to charge their cars. According to the Green Alliance, energy networks around the world are not ready for the surge in electric cars and solar panels that's coming in the next few years. Given all that, however, the momentum, the investment and the energy policies clearly are promoting electrification of vehicle transportation. Indeed, Amongst all the world's uncertainties, this one matter seems to be settled. Batteries and electric motors will have a major role in powering the cars and vehicles of the future. What's less certain though is how large this role will be, or perhaps more crucially, how quickly the shift to electrification will happen. The trend of electric powered vehicles has grown far beyond the hybrids of the ubiquitous Toyota Prius. Early last year, the Ford Motor Company announced that it would develop the hybrid versions of both its brawny F-150 pickup, the US's best-selling vehicle, and the performance-focused Mustang. At the end of 2017, Volvo stated that from 2019 onwards, all its new release models would be hybrid or electric. Yet there's undoubtedly life left in the old dog and eliminating the gas engine altogether will prove difficult if not impossible. The first reason is profitability. The stock of tiny Tesla may be worth more than General Motors or Ford, but it's yet to record an annual profit. Traditional car makers are making billions of dollars selling millions of gas-powered cars each. No one has yet figured out a way of making a profit selling electric-only vehicles. It was only recently that anyone offered an electric-only car at a competitive price that could go more than 200 miles on a single charge. The Chevrolet Bolt went on sale a couple of years ago, and the Tesla Model 3 will soon be rolling off the production lines in significant quantities. When it does, consumers will have paid $35,000 for an all-electric car that can travel 220 miles on a full charge. That might be the price threshold where we finally see electric vehicles take off. There's clearly a huge public appetite for electric vehicles. They're cleaner, quieter, longer lasting, and the running costs are significantly less. Additionally, as we've seen in China, India, and also Western Europe, air pollution is providing a big motive to go electric, not just for the general public, but also by government incentives. Conversely, any reduction in the government's commitment to fight air pollution could slow the uptake of electric vehicles, so could cheap gas prices or a lack of investment in charging infrastructure. The tug of war between the internal combustion engine and the electric motor is one of the most significant disruptors of the 21st century and will come to define how we get around. There's no doubt the internal combustion engines had a good run, and could still come to dominate shipping and aviation for years to come. But on land, electric motors will soon offer freedom and convenience more cheaply and cleanly. As economies start to refocus, and as the switch to electric cars reverses the trend in the rich world towards falling electricity consumption, 
policymakers will need to help by ensuring there's more than enough generation capacity to meet demand. The shift from fuel and pistons to batteries and electric motors is unlikely to take long. Indeed, the first death rattles of the internal combustion engine are already reverberating the world, and for many, the change can't come soon enough.